We love all of our Patreon supporters, and we hope that they love all of the bonus content that they get, like exclusive mini episodes, us playing games, ad-free episodes, and so much more, like swag. If you would like to hear your name on the show, just check us out on Patreon.com. And right now, we would like to say thank you so much to some of our newest supporters, Alicia from Spokane, Washington, Tiffany from Kaiser, Oregon, Jess from Camas, Washington, Laura from Mesa, Arizona, and Michelle from Louisville, Kentucky. And to get your name on the show, just visit us at patreon.com, and for 10 bucks a month, you'll get a shout out. This is Murder in the Rain where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Shannon Conway was born in Indiana on April 19, 1969, to parents Lawrence and Melanie Conway. Eventually, the family, including her brothers Stephen and James and sister Amy, moved to Florida. Shannon graduated high school and enrolled in Florida State University and eventually met Clay Starbuck when Clay was in Florida on vacation. The two hit it off and a romance bloomed, but as Clay lived and worked in Alaska, they didn't think they would ever see each other again. But they continued to talk and their relationship grew, and before long, they were married in 1990. Together, the pair had four children, Austin, Blake, Sutton, and Logan. Shannon and Clay divorced in 2000 due to multiple issues, one of which is that Shannon was a devout Mormon and Clay was not. And while she desperately wanted him to join her at her weekly church visits, that wasn't something he was interested in. While they were apart, Shannon became pregnant with her fifth child by another man. Loss of love was likely not an issue between Shannon and Clay because the pair got back together after four months being divorced, and they remarried in 2006. They moved to Deer Park, Washington, just minutes north of Spokane. Clay embraced Shannon's fifth child, Marshall, and raised him as his own. Clay worked in Alaska on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which meant that there were long stretches in the year where Shannon was the only caregiver to her five children. In fact, this put a strain on their relationship as she had to be caretaker, housekeeper, and disciplinarian while Clay got to come home and be what she called a Disney dad. You know, the dad that does all the fun things and none of the hard stuff. They ended up separating once again in 2009 and officially divorcing for the second time in July of 2011. They remained close both in the way they parented their children and in their location. When they separated, Clay moved into a home about a mile from the Starbuck home, and their two eldest sons, Austin and Blake, both considered adults, moved in with him, while the three youngest, all minors, remained with Shannon as she had full custody. These three, Sutton, Logan, and Marshall, stayed with their dad every other weekend and Wednesday evenings. Clay also drove them to school every morning while Shannon picked them up in the afternoon. As a child of divorce myself, this sounds like a very nice setup. In February of 2011, Clay experienced a back injury, which he would eventually have to have surgery for. This left him unable to work in Alaska, so he was on disability, putting him on a budget, but allowing him to be home and spend more time with his children. Normally, Clay made a good salary, which allowed him to pay a hefty sum of child support to his ex-wife every month. This changed with his injury and vastly reduced what he could contribute financially, which caused issues in their co-parenting relationship. He eventually owed Shannon $9,600 in back child support and attorney fees. Shannon seemed to be moving on with her life after divorcing. She's described by her friends as funny and classy, easy to talk to, and quick to smile and laugh. To her kids, she's a little embarrassing because she's the mom who took the time to stitch their baseball numbers and names into their hats. And to her ex-husband, she's known as a good mother. That was her only identity for years, a stay-at-home mom, 
But after filing for divorce, Shannon graduated from a dental assistant program with honors in 2010. And in July of 2011, she was shaking things up and took on the world of dating. According to Clay and his children, everyone was aware that Shannon was dating, including her neighbors. She was having fun, casual flings, and sometimes she would have men over to the house or she would stay over at theirs. While some people may have disapproved or slut-shamed her or worried for her safety, Shannon enjoyed her newfound lifestyle. The kids were cared for, and while she wasn't getting the $4,700 a month child support she was used to, Clay was present as a father. And then one day, everything changed. In December of 2011, the tiny city of Deer Park, Washington, was shaken with the horrific news that a local mother of five was found murdered in her own bed. Over the course of the investigation, police pieced together a grim scene. A man broke into her home and laid in wait for his opportunity to strike. He then violently murdered her and left her body in a state to humiliate and degrade her. To this day, there is a line drawn in the sand and a family is divided on who that man was. Was it a stranger? Was it an online lover? Was it her ex-husband? Though a man sits in prison convicted by his peers of the horrific murder of Shannon Starbuck, some of the people closest to her can't agree that he's the one who actually did it. On December 1, 2011, 15-year-old Logan Starbuck called their older brother Austin because their mother hadn't picked them up from school as anticipated. Austin drove over, picked Logan up, and brought them over to their father's house. Initially, there wasn't any real concern. They figured their mother had a date or another obligation and simply forgot the schedule. They continued to call their mother, but she didn't answer. So the three youngest children who lived with their mother spent the night at their father's house. The next day, one of the children texted their grandmother and mentioned that they hadn't been able to get in contact with their mom. Shannon's mother, Melanie Boissier, texted and called her daughter, and when she received the voicemail message that the mailbox was full, she became concerned. Melanie spoke to Shannon every single day. In fact, when interviewed by the news, Melanie claimed that in that moment when she heard that message, she knew her daughter was dead and that her ex-husband was involved. Clay agreed something was wrong. He was also concerned where his ex-wife was. It was unlike her to not respond to texts and calls. On December 2nd, 2011, he called police and asked that they conduct a wellness check. Police knocked on the door, no answer. They did a perimeter check and didn't see any signs of forced entry, so they left. You might ask yourself, why didn't Clay or their children have a key to the house? According to Shannon's brother, Steve, she recently changed her locks and hadn't given anyone a key yet. It was just her and her landlord. The worry and panic started to spread as Shannon's family spoke to other people in her life. Others that normally spoke to her daily hadn't heard from her at all. According to her friends, it was unheard of for Shannon to miss picking up her kids from school, let alone ignore their calls and texts. Something was terribly wrong. Eventually, Shannon's mother, Melanie, who lived in Florida, spoke to Shannon's landlord in the sheriff's office. She arranged for the sheriff to meet Shannon's landlord at the house so that they could take a look inside. Within a few moments of being inside Shannon's Starbucks home, the sheriff found her, dead in her own bed. The state of Shannon's body was shocking to the police of Deer Park. As they approached the main bedroom, they immediately saw Shannon splayed on the bed, facing the ceiling, nude and covered in bruises. Her body lay on top of a bloodstained mattress pad. There were no sheets. The blanket was on the floor and partially folded. Her body had been posed with her hands holding a personal massager, which lay on top of her pubic area and stomach, and there was a dildo inserted into her vagina. Next to her bed was a cell phone laying on top of the nightstand. Across the room, a gun safe was open, and several sex toys were placed on a shelf nearby. There was sperm collected from Shannon's left ankle and from her vagina. But she didn't show trauma to her vagina or anus, so while she appeared to have been sexually violated, there didn't seem to be evidence of a violent rape. Shannon's autopsy was performed by Spokane medical examiner Sally Aiken, who outlined the injuries Shannon sustained. 
Her body showed marks consistent with the use of a stun gun. She had bruising in her armpits, which were consistent with an unconscious body being moved or dragged. Shannon's cause of death was asphyxia due to compression of the neck. She didn't have a ligature mark present, and Dr. Aiken noted that this means something soft and or broad may have been used, such as a towel, a piece of clothing, a sheet, or even the crook of an arm. Shannon tested negative for drugs and alcohol, but her body had over 90 injuries, leading them to believe she was tortured, possibly for hours. Unfortunately, the time of death couldn't be narrowed down, and it was determined that Shannon died on either December 1st or December 2nd. With the soft tool being used, is that them thinking like it was held over her face or it was pressed around on her, her neck? neck? So basically okay. use it like a, a garrote or something. OK, you but know? it wasn't to where it left a line right, like as if it was string or something. It's very easy to tell if someone used their hands right. or a string or rope. But if it's wider, it's it's essentially impossible gotcha. to know what did it and left it left something behind. Uh, but yeah, she, she noted a few things. And some of, the, some of those things were found in the home. The investigation began the moment the sheriff placed a foot in Shannon's home. And he knew right away that this was not only a terrible, torturous murder, but the killer was trying to tell a story with the tableau they left behind. While they sorted out what exactly the killer was trying to convey, they kept their lips sealed initially about the state Shannon was found in while they notified her family she was dead. Police and investigators began parking along the street in front of Shannon's Starbucks house. As her sons drove past their mother's house on the way home to their father's, they knew something terrible had happened. Before long, Shannon's ex-husband Clay arrived on the scene to speak to police. He was visibly upset and wanted to know what was happening. Initially, no one would tell him anything, but eventually he spoke to detectives who told him Shannon was dead. They began to ask Clay lots of questions about Shannon and the people in her life. He was incredibly forthcoming with information and willing to help to try to figure out what had happened to her. When asked if he knew if there was anyone who wanted to harm her or if she was seeing anyone, Clay told police that Shannon was seeing multiple men and regularly had them over to the house. He talked about the dating site she was on, including one that catered to single Mormons. He was open about his concerns for his safety on the subject, as she was speaking to multiple men online and didn't know who they really were. Detectives, ready to dig into the case and investigate everyone in Shannon's life, told Clay they would speak to him at a later date. But he was so eager to help that people reflected that as he walked away, he continued telling them that they needed to check her phone and computer and they would find everything they needed. He was convinced someone from the Internet murdered his ex-wife. Not because Clay told them to, but because that's their job, police immediately began reviewing Shannon's cell phone, which they had found on her nightstand. She had several messages that proved to be interesting to police. Two of the conversations were with men that, according to the details in the messages, she intended to meet up with in person. In one of those messages, a request for Shannon to send provocative, posed pictures was made. This piqued the interest of investigators as the pose requested wasn't far off from how they found her body. Police immediately reached out to the man behind the text, one Tom Walker, a car salesman from Spokane, Washington. Tom was incredibly open with police, even walking them through every text in their conversation, telling them where he was when they had the conversation, and even giving a DNA sample. There wasn't more they could do until they had the DNA results, so they moved on to the other people they needed to question. The other conversation of interest was found in one of the dating apps. Shannon was writing to a man named John Wilson, or the screen name Just Wondering 06. In their messages, they were attempting to make plans to meet in person on December 1st. So police wondered, did they meet in person? It's possible that John was the last person who saw Shannon alive. Looking into John's phone number led police to a public phone booth, which makes sense because they soon learned he wasn't who he said he was. 
After some digging into his online profiles and other information, they learned this person had stolen someone else's profile picture, a doctor from another state, and pretended to be someone else while he was trying to woo Shannon, who he had met in person several times already. Wanting to know exactly what John was hiding, a detective eventually sent a message via the dating app and was able to get in contact with him. After some persuasion, he eventually met with detectives to explain his relationship with Shannon. And by persuasion, I mean under threat. They told him if he didn't tell them his true identity and meet them for an interview, they were going to blast his image all over the news and internet. One of the locations he had called Shannon from was equipped with surveillance, and they were able to uncover video that clearly showed his face. They soon learned why John pushed so hard to avoid meeting with them. His name was really John Kenline, and he was a married schoolteacher from Spokane. I know. John and his lawyer met with police. Though nervous, John explained that he had made plans to meet with Shannon and arrived at her house at 10.30 a.m. on December 1st. She didn't answer, so he went to a payphone in Spokane and left her a message. That was validated by the police. He called her multiple times and even went back to her house four times, but each time he called, there was no answer. But eventually, she sent him a reply via text. In her messages, she said she still wanted to meet with him maybe later that night. John was steadfast that he did not kill Shannon, but his alibi was shaky because he didn't have anyone who could say beyond a reasonable doubt that they saw him where he claims he was throughout the day. Police kept John high on the list of possible suspects, and since they didn't really have an alibi, they dug into phone records to figure out where he was, where Shannon was, and when they communicated. And while they sifted through copious amounts of text messages, app conversations, and phone calls logged in the records that the phone company provided, they realized Shannon had called 911 on December 1st. 911, what are you reporting? Hello? After the caller hung up, the dispatcher called the number back only to go straight to voicemail. Hi, this is Shannon. Please leave a message. It was pretty lucky that they uncovered the 911 call because the medical examiner was unsure of the exact time of death, which makes it incredibly hard on potential suspects to clear their own names. You could say you have an alibi and that you were somewhere else, but there's no way to prove that that was at the correct time, right? Is that actually an alibi if you right. can't prove it? The 911 call narrowed down the likely time of death. The 28-second long call was made at 9.17 a.m. on December 1st. Now with the understanding of when Shannon was likely killed, police went back to review their internet records of Tom Walker and John Kenline. Tom Walker, the car salesman and sexter who requested a dirty pick, had been at a funeral the morning of December 1st. He was seen by dozens of people. John was at Shannon's home at 10.30 that morning, a little over an hour after the call. But before he went there, he was at a Starbucks coffee in Spokane picking up his favorite Frappuccino. This was confirmed with the store, and the timeline means he couldn't have been at Shannon's house to kill her. So, who killed her? Detectives went back to reviewing everything they knew, and they started to look for suspects outside of the two men that they had easily found in her phone records. Her friends had mentioned that Shannon had been having a hard time in recent weeks and that she had noticed someone was apparently breaking into her home and moving things around. The windows of a car in her driveway were shot out. She had even filed police reports for some of these things. According to Shannon, she thought her ex-husband was the culprit. She changed her locks and didn't give keys to anyone, not even her own children, because she was so scared Clay would get to her. These reports were investigated, but they didn't go anywhere because Clay was able to prove that on at least one of those occurrences, he was in Alaska. But now, Shannon was dead and detectives couldn't leave one stone unturned. Police sat down with Clay Starbuck again. Like before, Clay was forthcoming with his whereabouts the day his ex-wife was murdered. According to Clay, his back pain was so severe, even after the surgery he had over the previous summer, that it left him unable to sleep at night. His typical schedule had him up well after midnight. He'd take a nap, 
wake up around 7 a.m., pick the kids up, then get them to school around 8. Then he would go home and sleep until noon. The morning of December 1, 2011, Clay got up at 7 a.m. to pick the kids up from Shannon's and take them to school. But as he was on his way there, his 1988 Toyota Tercel broke down. He sent his children, who were getting ready for school, several texts between 7.11 and 7.53 a.m. to let them know that he was having car trouble and to see if Shannon was awake. He also texted Shannon at 8.06 to ask if she could take the kids to school due to his car issues. She wrote back and said that she would. Once he got her text, he claims that he walked home and went to bed. He went on to say that he woke up around 11 a.m. and walked back to his car. He claims to have done that walk four times that day, attempting to restart his car and get it home. Around 3.30, he said Shannon texted to ask him if he could pick up the kids. We now know that she was dead at the time of the text, so who was texting him? Detectives felt right away that Clay was suspicious. He was all too willing to talk to them, too over the top when he cried, and in their opinion, he was trying to redirect their attention to the, quote, multiple men Shannon was sleeping with. What Clay didn't know is that detectives were building a case against him. They dissected it all. They canvassed the road Clay claimed his car was broken down on, the one he walked down four times, and yet not a single person saw him or his car that day. No matter... They could check his cell phone to review the timestamps that his phone pinged the cell towers to determine where he was. Surely that would show him walking back and forth on that road that day. Unfortunately, his cell phone was either turned off or it was dead. There were no pings. They did find a house nearby that had a surveillance camera pointed directly at the road Clay drove, parked on, and walked along. They watched every minute of it and never saw him or his car. Ooh, that's not good for his case. As guilty as they thought he was, they couldn't make an arrest yet. Eventually, they caught a break. Male DNA was found on Shannon and her cell phone. When the report finally came back, several samples were marked as unknown male. But there were a few samples that were labeled Starbuck male. Considering all of her children, including her male sons, were confirmed as being at either work or school during the time of her murder, detectives knew they had their man. On February 6, 2012, two months after Shannon's murder, Clay Starbuck was pulled over and arrested for aggravated, premeditated murder in the first degree with aggravating circumstances and sexually violating human remains. A warrant was issued on his home, and several items were taken. Documents, cameras, computers, and cell phones. Detectives found Shannon's death certificate tacked on the wall in his closet, which led police to believe it was a sign of him keeping it like a trophy. But his children say it was merely kept there so he wouldn't lose it. In fact, his son Blake said that that was totally false, that a detective knocked it off a shelf, picked it up, pinned it to the wall, and later used it against Clay. Which would be surprising to no one. True. With her autopsy, it was shown that she didn't. it didn't appear to be a rape. So they couldn't prove that she had any, like, there was no vaginal or anal tearing. Right. Which would indicate a forcible rape, right? right? But she did have the dildo. So some people said, well, that's, you can't say someone put it there after her death. You can't prove that it wasn't there right. while she well, died. Well, and I'm just thinking, too, with the sperm, it's like, well, that is your ex-husband. I'm just thinking from a defense point of view, that feels pretty easy there, to create reasonable doubt. Yes, to say. you will learn there is a lot, especially with how they found her body. There's a lot that could be dissected. Yeah. We'll get into it. Yes. You're not going to be surprised. I by just wanted to this, clarify because I'm like, hmm, OK. Yeah. While they searched the house and built their case, Clay Starbuck was held on a million dollar bond due to the nature of his crime. He was also prohibited from speaking to any of his children because they were key witnesses in the upcoming trial. Starbucks' trial was set to kick off on January 14, 2012. However, due to a request made by his attorneys, it was pushed back to March, which then turned into June of 2013. Let's start by presenting a summary of the prosecution's case. They argued a very clear case. Clay Starbuck, motivated by money and jealousy, killed his ex-wife and tried to make it look like one of her two lovers did it. 
It was a very circumstantial case, but there was plenty of testimony that helped to support that Clay wasn't some sweet father and ex-husband co-parenting with his ex-wife. He was actually jealous and angry and wanted to get back at her. And it didn't help that they did not have him on camera walking where he said he was. It certainly didn't. Prosecutors spoke to Shannon's dentist, who said that Shannon had confided in him that she was worried Clay might hurt her due to the child support he owed her, over $9,000. Her friends from dental school said that Shannon was once visibly upset because her ex-husband had left her a sex toy on her doorknob with a note that said something about him not being able to have her. Other friends say they witnessed him being jealous and controlling. Detectives reflected at how contrived Clay seemed on scene and in subsequent interviews. He was over the top with his crying. He was insistent with information, some of which he kept repeating, like her phone and computer, being able to tell them everything they needed to know. He often inserted leading information. For instance, in court documents, one detective noted that he felt Clay was, quote, telegraphing or what we would call planting seeds because he mentioned dildos when he was talking about his wife. They thought he was suspicious from the get-go. For those of you who like science and DNA when determining someone's guilt, there was DNA evidence at the crime scene and on Shannon's body that didn't belong to her. DNA belonging to a male Starbuck was found on Shannon's throat, cheek, under her nails, and on her cell phone. Both of her sons have alibis as Austin was at work and Blake was at school at the time of the murder. And of course, Marshall was determined to have a different father altogether. Which they determined with the DNA testing. No one knew. Oh, I, really? Yeah, I think Clay knew, but no one else like knew. Like the kids and everything. That's yeah. how he found out. Yeah, Oof, that's terrible. That's really rough. John Kenline took the stand to talk about his text back and forth with Shannon the day she was murdered. The prosecution believed that Clay had been the one texting John. And to prove this, that he had the phone, they entered evidence of a text from 3.06 p.m. The text was from Shannon's phone to Logan's phone, and it said, quote, Send Marsh a note that dad will be there in 10. Marsh was a nickname for Marshall, the youngest son. It's highly unlikely that a random booty call or a psycho killer off the street would know her son's nickname. So if she was dead, which they have determined she was, who could have sent mm. that text knowing that nickname? They described why Clay killed her and how he killed her. He was motivated by the $9,000 he owed Shannon. Pair that with the fact that she was having sexual relations with other men. He was fueled by jealousy and finally did something about it. On the morning of December 1st, Clay used a clever ruse to get Shannon out of the house. A single text that his car broke down and he needed her to drive the kids to school. While she was out of the house doing just that, he broke in like she had complained about him doing in the past. But this time he hid, waiting for her to return. Once she arrived, he attacked her, choked her to death, and then violated her body with sex toys and posed her in a humiliating manner. He then used her phone to send texts to the men she was seeing in order to make it look like she was still alive and making plans with them. His goal was to lead police to those men and make it look like one of them killed his ex-wife. Now for the defense. To put it short, their argument was that someone else committed the crime. The DNA that was found at the crime scene and on Shannon's throat could be explained. Firstly, it wasn't tied to a specific individual. It was tied to a Starbuck male. Clay Starbuck had been in that home many times. In fact, he used to live there and sleep in that bed. Shannon's sons were regularly in the home, having also lived there. So this was something defense argued did not show Clay's guilt. It just showed that the DNA was all over the house. So you might be wondering, why don't we know the individual DNA? The company that did the forensic testing didn't do any mitochondrial DNA testing, which would allow them to determine if DNA is matched to one of the sons. Instead, they swabbed for YSTR DNA, which can only get you as far as determining it's male and what family it's consistent with.
This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. For me, the last few years have brought relationship strain along with the realization that I've been struggling with anxiety and other mental health issues. I finally decided that how I care for my mind affects how I experience my life, so it's important to invest time and care into keeping it healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or taking power naps. There's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. I've always been a strong supporter of therapy, not only for myself, but for friends and family. With therapists being booked out for months and staffing shortages, I've recommended using BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you and your brain to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life and how to manage it in a healthy way. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Murder in the Rain. That's BetterHelp.com slash Murder in the Rain. That's really strange, especially when you're talking about like a murder trial. It sure is when someone's life is on the line, literally their entire life, and you're doing basic like could, testing. You're, you're, all you're confirming is it could possibly be. That's really strange that they didn't. There was also a fingerprint located on the box of the personal massager found to the left of the bed. And when compared to clay, it was not a match. There was also a matter of untested evidence. The semen found on Shannon's ankle wasn't tested. There were sex toys and condoms that were never fingerprinted. There was a fitted sheet and a towel in the laundry room that had stains and possible bodily fluids found on them. They were not tested. All in all, they were pointing to there being plenty of reasonable doubt that Clay Starbuck had not committed this murder. Now, they wanted to argue that Shannon was living a dangerous lifestyle, one where she was sexually active with many men. In fact, in the month of November of 2011, Shannon had been sharing explicit texts, photos and videos with at least 10 men she had met online. However, unlike many cases we've come across, the judge ruled that evidence of the, her, quote, risky lifestyle was prejudicial and it could not be included in the trial. Good. So basically, they couldn't point their fingers at these two men because they had their alibis cleared. So you can't dig into the, the content of their texts to say there might be hundreds of other men out there. Like, yeah. it just didn't make sense. And, and I like that because it feels like it protects her from the defense. Yeah, you'd think. During his trial, Clay Starbuck took the stand. And if you were to ask, how did that go for him? It's kind of a split answer. On one side, he had answers to almost everything that he was being accused of. Again, the bulk of the case is that he was accused of killing his wife and then staging the scene like one of her lovers did it. For the most part, he had clear and concise answers. Since the majority of the case was circumstantial, that could go well for him. But he also had some notably concerning answers and he avoided answering some questions. Clay admitted on trial, on, up on the stand, to installing spyware on Shannon's computer. That's how he knew about all of the dating sites and the men she was talking to. He claims it's because he was worried about her safety, you know, dating so many strangers. But, like, step back and look at this like any true crime case. That doesn't look good. That, to me, could easily for the prosecution, flow into motive of being a jealous ex who retaliated. When he was cross-examined by prosecution, he had trouble answering questions about the details of her murder, yet he had sat through hours of testimony about it in court. This confused people. But to be fair, if I was on trial for murder and someone asked me, uh, do you think the killer was trying to send a message when considering that Shannon's body was violated and sex toys were left everywhere, I might hesitate to answer worried that my response would be misconstrued. Mm -hmm. But I also have to think that his team would have prepped him for questions like that. You'd hope so. So by not answering them, I think the jury uh, may not like that. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you're going to be open enough to say like other bad things you've done, yeah. like the spyware, but then there's some point that you get to that you don't respond, it's like, 
that's because you're hiding something. Right. Boy, this is a real whodunit. After a two-week trial, the jury deliberated for two full days. Eventually, they found Clay Starbuck guilty of aggravated first-degree murder and sexually violating human remains. In late June of 2013, the judge finally passed down the sentencing, giving Starbuck a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. He now makes his home in the Airway Heights Correctional Center, a medium security jail in eastern Washington. In 2015, a Clay appealed his life sentence conviction. His team argued that there were many issues with the evidence and that there were other suspects that were disregarded. Texts from Shannon's phone had showed that she was involved with at least two other men, and it looked like they were ongoing sexual relationships that were happening up until the day she was murdered. The messages themselves were left out of the trial because police eliminated them as suspects, citing their alibis. In the 2015 appeal, the court upheld the conviction and ruled that there was no error. Clay and Shannon's five children support their father. They are so opposed to the idea that their father did this that they actually run multiple social media accounts and a website dedicated to clearing their father's name. In 2021, 10 years after Shannon's murder, the Starbuck family was back in the news when it finally seemed like someone was willing to consider the possibility that Clay Starbuck was innocent. Blake Starbuck, who was 18 when his mother was murdered, has always been vocal that his father was not to blame. He told media outlets that there was evidence that was not tested, and in 2021, a Spokane judge granted a motion for post-conviction DNA testing for not only the evidence that wasn't tested, but for the evidence that already was tested, such as the swab from her neck. They're going to retest it for mitochondrial DNA. This is huge. Yeah. That is not very common. It's nice that the judge saw that and was like, yeah, why wasn't this tested for that? And is actually correcting it. According to Blake, there were three sets of male DNA found on his mother and her belongings. Some were merely marked as unknown male. He even suggests, get hold on to your butts. He even suggests that Israel Keys, the serial killer, should be considered a possible suspect as he admitted to killing people in eastern Washington. He also grew up in Colville, Washington, which is very close to Spokane, and he was apprehended only a month after Clay. Hmm. Very interesting. Indeed. I mean, it's kind of one of those look over there things, but what if he was right? Yeah. Hmm. Some people may question, so do they really have an argument that Clay is innocent? And I think they do. It's strong enough that the Washington Innocence Project has gotten involved. But honestly, I don't know much more than that. I'm unsure if the evidence is in testing, waiting to be tested, if there's a long backlog. But I imagine at some point we're going to get an update on the family's Facebook, their web page or the Instagram. I do have one very sad update to share. This family has seen a massive amount of heartache after losing Shannon, but it didn't end there. In December of 2021, it was the 10-year anniversary of the loss of their mother, and that particular year, Logan was having a harder time than ever. Logan had major things on their mind. They had recently made the decision to begin transitioning to male and had future plans for surgery. But according to Blake, 25-year-old Logan, who was autistic and living on their own, had a part-time caretaker and had been going through a lot of personal issues. Their license had been suspended after some car accidents, Bills were late being paid, and they recently had a breakup. Add on the 10-year anniversary of the loss of their mother, and it became an unbearable time in their life. Blake tried to get a hold of Logan on December 16th, but his calls went to voicemail. The next day, he spoke to Logan's caretaker, who had plans to meet with Logan a few days later, but they were also unable to get a hold of them. When neither Blake nor the caretaker were able to get in contact with Logan for days, they went to their apartment and found the car was still there. They were able to get inside after contacting the maintenance team, but it was clear no one had been there for some time. On December 22nd, Blake filed a missing person report. The investigation started swiftly with police tracking Logan's bank and social media activity. Looking back to the days prior to Logan going missing, police were able to get surveillance video from December 18th, 
that showed Logan on the city bus headed to downtown Spokane. They were wearing shorts, a hoodie, a flannel shirt, and it was a whopping 8 degrees Fahrenheit outside. On the 19th, a couple of people visiting Spokane stumbled upon a phone, wallet, earbuds, and keys sitting in a beanie outside of a store they were visiting. They brought the items to the Spokane Parks Visitation Center Lost and Found, where they were later linked to Logan. Days went by and there was no new info on Logan's whereabouts, so the family hired a canine handler who began searching for Logan on December 27th. They started near the area where the belongings were found and moved out towards the river. The dogs picked up Logan's scent several times, but ultimately it ended with no success. For weeks, Logan's family searched and worried, but on January 10th of 2022, Logan's body was pulled from the Spokane River. The question became, did Logan commit suicide or was someone else involved? There are a few witnesses that came forward claiming that Logan was with a tall man, around six foot four inches tall, with light chocolate complexion and who goes by the name Frank. Another person says they spoke to Logan for over an hour, asking them to come inside a warming center, but that Logan refused, saying they were afraid of someone who was looking for them. In March of this year, the medical examiner confirmed to media Logan died due to asphyxia from drowning and that it was a suicide. But it makes you wonder about the eyewitness testimonies where people just trying to get attention. There's no telling why people would say things. Especially being autistic and processing heavy emotions Mm -hmm. like that. I don't know to what degree. Right. right. um, But I imagine with a part time caretaker, there was some need involved. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's let's talk about this case. It's a lot of uh, whodunit. I can see where the assumption of the ex-husband doing it would come from, you know, the spyware and the alibi. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of damning evidence. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if I were a juror, it sounds like there's quite a bit of reasonable doubt that it would be pretty hard to feel that certain about it. I agree. If this were just the DNA, if I was on the jury, I would be like, you didn't test the DNA. If this were any other jury, any other day, any other courtroom, any other state, it could have been a very different case. Yeah. I do believe there is reasonable doubt in there because there's so much untested evidence and there's DNA that you like can't officially say belonged to him. I mean, if you ask me, who do you think did it? I do think he probably did it, but I also think that he deserved his appeal to be accepted. You have to think or you hope, I guess, that someone who's in jail or prison for something like this, who fights and fights and fights and fights to get things tested, is because they want to prove their innocence. Obviously, we have seen people with narcissism and other things going on where it backfires. But it's really hard to imagine that you would spend the time, money, effort, everything to get that tested, knowing that the outcome would be you did it. So it really makes you wonder, what is that other DNA? What is it that proves it was from the murder, you know, as 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 opposed to the life, you know, the life DNA that you encounter and that you have on you from just being in your home. Well, I think it would have been a lot more palatable, this guilty verdict, if they could say that DNA is Mm -hmm. his, that DNA is officially not his son's and it's a Starbuck DNA, then it makes it much more obvious. Not only that, but it's, it's his DNA. Even at that point, I would have a hard time especially for a couple that has proven to separate and reconnect mm-hmm. and then be real and there's no sign of it being an assault that's really hard to take that as well and that's not to say oh this guy is innocent we've we've got to you know take a look at it but it's like everyone deserves their fair shot we were watching something yesterday and literally this lady was like oh i was sitting in my house and then the cops knocked on my door and they arrested me for a murder and I didn't know what they were talking about. And that's such a terrifying concept. So it's that idea of like, whether or not he did it, everything should be tested, everything should be proven. Yeah, and I mean, they do have a strong argument in a sense. Yes, it's circumstantial. I I mean, the statistics are in their favor that he did this, and uh, their story made complete sense. And there are concerning things, obviously. There are some serious red flags. Um, I just think as a onlooker in a Mm -hmm. jury being objective 
that's weird that, yeah. that dna that would be enough for me to be like uh ah, no we need to test it mm-hmm. you need a new trial I, like you're getting a hung jury until you come back with some test results yeah because you know this is not to say it was any of the children but when you say it's anyone could that mean it was a former brother-in-law could that mean it was her children we've seen cases you know you can't rule things out yeah until you have that exact evidence to rule it out you know an alibi is fine and dandy but it, being able to match that dna to to um the specific person yeah i don't know i just it's so it's such a problem for me that yeah. um and now a lot of their argument is kind of silly to me. A lot of their argument I don't think is an argument, but when it comes to the the evidence, I think they do have a very valid argument. And I was hoping we would be able to get Blake to talk to us mm-hmm. about kind of the family stance and all the all the points that he has yeah. about why he sh- his dad shouldn't be in jail. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't make that work. So I will include his website in the sources, and it really clearly outlines all their arguments. So yeah. I, I highly suggest reading that. Formulate your own opinion. Like I said, I I personally have a gut feeling he is guilty. But then again, that's unfair because I don't think his case was proved. I don't think that case was totally proved. Um, the one thing that really, uh, what do you say, stuck in my craw about this case, you know, there's no slut shaming in court that wasn't allowed. But uh, his kids do it. The kids do it. Oh, they talk about, about their mom. Yeah, they talk about their mom and how she had all of these boyfriends and how she was dangerous and how, and, and this could be true, like that she dragged them to different men's houses, but the way they talk about it so openly with media just kind of slanders her name. It's like victim blaming, basically. And it's really hard to see that. Even her youngest child, who has a totally different biological father, 100% on the dad's side says these things. And, and that's a little hard to palate. And I understand like they're processing a terrible thing. They're trying to understand what happened to their father, their father, excuse me. Um, but that's so hard, like as a woman to hear that. Mm-hmm. I wonder what that psychology is. If it's like because mom had these boyfriends and one of these boyfriends did it to her, we've also lost our dad. I think like, they blame her that for them not being together. Yeah. That it was less about dad being absent and their relationship fracturing and or, you know, their difference of religious opinions and more about her moving on and finding all these men. She had been Mormon, right? She was Mormon. She was Mormon, and then that was the conflict. That right there, it's like... One. That was one conflict. Right. I mean, the conflict in religion, but it's like... That's a big one. That makes sense. That, to me, when I hear a former Mormon who's older and her she's had her kids and now she gets to live for her, it's like... Yeah, she's gonna be dating. I yeah, she's gonna and be figuring things out. Let's be clear, she was Mormon up till the day she died. But yes, yeah, she was exploring sides of herself yeah. that are usually um, suppressed when yeah. you are in a religious. Upbringing. I know, for me, the people that I've known, which are quite a few, that have left any kind of really intense religion like that, it it kind of is like a second puberty. It's like yeah, you're relearning it's like yourself. Yeah, you're going out and you're doing all the things you never did, figuring out your sexuality, and you may figuring stop. Out who you are, yeah. And you may move on and stop and be more laid back, and you may continue. We don't know. She was in a new yeah. phase of her life. Yeah, that's really sad that that's seen as that's why it happened, or she yeah. brought it to herself. It just or... like overshadows the fact that they did indeed love her, and their lives were tragically ripped apart by this. But maybe that is a way to support their father more. Like, that's hard. You lost both your parents and you feel justice wasn't done. Another thing about this case that was rough, and I'm surprised you didn't ask about it, was the 911 call being found weeks later. Mm. So I just want to clarify, apparently some phones don't store 911 calls. So when you make it, you cannot see it in the call log. So when the police searched her phone, they didn't see it. Oh, so okay. now how how it would normally work is they would obviously find out from the call logs from 911. Well, the dispatcher fucked up. There was the specific protocol that happened. So when a hang up occurs, when someone calls 911 and they hang up and you don't know, is this a real call in Washington? You are supposed to call back twice. So if you don't get a hold of them one time, you call again and then you log it in a dispatch log that the police looks at. So it doesn't just end with the caller or with the dispatcher. It then goes to someone else to determine 
is that an emergency? That never happened. They only oh. called once and they never logged it. So that's why it took weeks for mm. them to even find out. They found out from the phone company, you know? Wow. Um, so that was disappointing. And I will say, I can't believe the person, the dispatcher, wasn't disciplined. They were not disciplined at all. I, I know it's, you know, mistakes happen, but. That seems pretty glaring oh, if, it, if that's basic protocol. Imagine what you could have known sooner. Like, I don't think it would have prevented her death by any means. Right. So I'm not putting that on them. But I think a lot of things in the case could have been found sooner. Yeah. What evidence could have been uh, hid mm -hmm. after the fact because it's been days. So the whole case, like, it's important to remember Shannon was a woman trying to forge the life she wanted. Her friends loved her and said all these amazing things about her being funny and strong and approachable. And she was this hardworking stay-at-home mom who went back to school, was a parent, graduated with honors like that's hard yeah like she was very hardworking, and i think a lot of what she's remembered by is overshadowed by all these men she apparently dated and we don't even know how many she met in person exactly you know how many you talk to on a dating app before you meet someone yeah. in person so i think that that's really cruel and i and i hate that about this case but i also hate that they didn't test that that dna for clay because that's his life yeah They've both been wronged in very different ways. I agree. And so I'm very interested to see if I get to bring you guys an update at some point. Um, and of course, we will the minute we find out. Yeah, I'm I'm very intrigued by the fact that the Innocence Project is involved because they don't take that lightly. Yep. They don't. They That's don't, what drew my attention. Yeah. They don't put their reputation on the line for just someone saying I didn't do this. They're very intentional with their choices of who they support yep so that tells me either there's something in the in the documentation or they're just really pushing that hard for the testing just, just i mean to have it, the answer it is a real failure of justice to not test that dna thoroughly and to not to just like not test all the evidence especially found on her body yeah like what why i want to know the reason for that mm -hmm. um so in in guilty people can be wronged too right yeah like Again, this is his life. Could he have gotten a sentence with parole if, you know, if something worked out different? I don't know. A ton of a ton of things could be different. Yeah. And that'll be interesting. I hope that there are some updates soon. I hope that they do test it and they either know they have the right guy or they start over and get the bad guy off the street. And if any of the Starbucks children hear this episode and do want to have their voice heard, I am more than happy to have them on and walk us through their point of view because yeah, I absolutely. think that that is incredibly intriguing yeah I know you're gonna have to do it all again real nice <laughs> <laughs> you say mini episodes ad free episodes bonus content um swag pictures of us <laughs> Can okay. you write it down? No. With that, no. Remember how she gets with that? Don't I even. Sure do. I remember that. I'll just do it. Well. Just give me a second. I'll I am do it. traumatized from that day. Just kidding. <laughs> Darling, don't get shame. All right, voice. Can you handle it? I don't think you can handle it. I don't think you're ready for this jelly. Pee on that tree. See if it will die. Ah! <laughs> what the fuck? I couldn't see anything. What just happened? I oh my god! Oh, I got. I only saw a sliver, a sliver oh of falling. Oh my god! What just happened? <laughs> so Are you okay? <laughs> I don't Are know. Are you okay? Did that hit you? I'm okay. fine. Okay. Shit. But is our equipment fine? Yes, we're rolling. We're rolling. Jesus. Oh, shit. We need more Patreon members to pay for new equipment. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Is your chair okay? <laughs> I don't know. Is man. anything okay? Did anyone pee their pants? How did that even happen? I don't. Never a good idea. And then you had to move I was shit. climbing out of my chair to avoid all this shit. So next time you have that thought, oh don't do it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Mouth treasures.
from the corner of my mouth. I freaking love Mountain Dew and I'm always shocked when people don't like it. I, I mean, I've loved it so much I had to avoid it for 20 years. <laughs> I think people, I think it's a judgmental thing. I think people, there's like a stigma to Mountain Dew. You're like, you live in your parents' basement and play video bro, games. <laughs> skateboarder who like only eats Taco Bell. And it's like, I am a stoner. I do only eat Taco only Bell. Eats Taco Bell. <laughs> That's why I love Mountain Dew. Leave me alone. Every morning, you know, people are drinking their eight ounces of coffee and you, he has a two liter of Code Red on his desk, halfway drink by 9 a.m. I mean, a two liter? every day. He's every, drinking a two liter a day? Every day. And I, that's just at work. I don't know what he does at home. Well, and you have to go pee all the time. And I never want to, like, take my pants off because they're always tight, you know? Preemptively screaming. <laughs> you do do that. <laughs> <laughs> what do they know about Zac Efron? But, 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 but. Well, not, I, what, uh, <laughs> you said it was bad. <sighs> That cough was so loud, I saw the light flicker. What? A sum. Did I embrace a word? Did I hell a word? Which caused issues in their co-parenting re- co-parenting relationship. <laughs> Fucking shit. The sheriff found her. Yes. Wait. Huh? Sheriff. You did. You pulled a me. What did I say? Sheriff? sheriff. <laughs> the sheriff found. I did it again. You the did. sheriff. And he. That was. Was that the same? Was that the same? <clears throat> Examiner, what? <laughs> what, an, what an interesting name. Where are they from? <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, you did say ligature. Did I? Yeah. Oh, I thought I was careful. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I'll never know, maybe. I think I hit my head. We shouldn't have had such a lively chat about Big Brother earlier. <laughs> All over the news and inter- internet. <laughs> Send his children. God sent his children. Some words are hard for me. It's the th mm-hmm. and the t sound. And the t and the a uh, b. No. D- it's those a- ending. Text. G- text is hard uh, without sounding j- like an idiot, like you're over pronouncing. Uh, mm, mm, you uh, shut your <laughs> face proclivity. Or no, what did you mess up earlier? What can't she say? I don't uh, remember. It's uh W X W Z. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls.